everyone. Thank you very much for watching. And today I have a very, very special guest. I'm very excited for this one. Wayne Alexander, legendary professional boxer, competed from 1995 to 2006, won the WBU light middleweight world title, and also challenged for the WBO light middleweight world title as well. At regional level, he held the British title, EBU European title, and the Southern Area title, all at light middleweight. Wayne also had a stellar amateur career as well, winning uh, the 1994 ABA uh, Light Middleweight Championship. He was three-time, I've actually got a list here, by the way, there's so many accomplishments. Uh, he was actually three-time SE London ABA champion, boxed uh, for England at the Liverpool Multinations as well, uh, boxed for England against Denmark and Scotland, and his fights have been shown on TV uh, all over the place, including Sky TV and Box Nation. So he's accomplished a lot. He's now a judge and referee. So uh, today we have a lot to talk about. Um, today we have a lot to talk about indeed of Wayne's stellar uh, amateur and professional career and what he's doing in life now, aspects of his training, mentality for fights, and quite a few other things. Uh, it'll be a good one for any boxing fan. So Champ, the first thing is to say a big thank you for coming on the show as well. I, I appreciate you uh, making the time for this, by the way, just to say a big thank you. Thank you, Liam, as well. You know, um... I said to you before, boxing is my life, has been my life from the age of 11. So, you know, I love I love speaking about my, my career. And, um, you know, it's, it's great that people still remember me and, and want to talk to me. So <laughs> I'm happy. Oh, well, they certainly do. They certainly do. I believe you have a large following to this day. And uh, I certainly believe your, your fights are fondly remembered. A lot of boxing shows I go to and I go to a lot, um, they're often talked about. So... Definitely got some good things to discuss today. Now, I do want to uh, start with the present day, you know, before we, we go back in time to uh, all of your amazing accomplishments. Um, when researching for this, uh, and also I follow your Instagram and things like that as well, I see some of the refereeing and judging and some of the work you're doing now. And I really think that the fans would like to know a bit about um, what you're doing, you know, right now in, in 2021 and uh, some of that work. So could you share with us a, a little bit um, about the judging, the refereeing and and so on, please. Yes, I've been doing refereeing and judging for about ten years now. I actually first started it by um, by off chance. I was I was at a show in the Clapham Grand in South London, and the police were having their annual boxing match against the fire brigade, and um, basically one of the referees pulled out last minute, could make it, and I was there as a, as a, a supporter. Somebody asked me, "Do I want to um, have a go at refereeing? Do I want to do I want to jump in?" I was like, "You're having a laughing." Yeah, I mean, I can't do that. Like thinking, "No, no, no." And I was basically persuaded to go, have a go. I went in the ring. I was absolutely crapping myself. I felt like I was fighting myself. Do you know what I mean? I felt like I was the one being watched. Anyway, long story short, I um, done an okay job, and um. I felt the, the adrenaline buzz like it was like I was fighting. You know, what I mean, it's like the, the nearest thing to actually fighting itself. And like I said, um, after that, they um, they said to me, "Do you want to do it again?" And they brought me again for the next the next show, which was a couple of months time. And word went around on on the um the, on the circuit that I was I was doing refereeing. And then you know, lo and behold, within the next year, I was working with top promotions, the ultra white collar boxing circuit white collar boxing promotions the queensbury league promotions so basically like for the last 10 years that is what i've you know been doing um which is like the nearest thing to fighting also also judging as well so, uh, yeah it's a good insight it's a very good insight because a lot of your fans will know that but some may not and certainly today i've tried to, to sort of pick questions from uh you know, for, for the fans that give insights into things that they don't always see. So when we take a look back at your career, uh, there's a lot of stuff to talk about, and there's certainly more fights than we can talk about today, all of them. But I picked a few key ones to go back okay. so I'm going to go all the way back in time a little bit now to, to early on in, in your pro career. I'm going to start there. When you won the uh, Southern Area title uh, against OJ Abrahams, a fantastic uh, fight. Obviously, you rematched him, won that one as well. But I want to sort of Go back there because I believe you were 10 and 0 uh, already at that time, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, when you challenged for the southern area. Yeah. Your title often gets overlooked, uh, not with yourself personally, but just 
with quite a few fighters I've interviewed. So I want to go back there as your first major pro title. What are your recollections from the fight now, uh, however many years on? Very proud achievement. Uh, what would you like to um, share with the fans about that one uh, as, a, as a place to start? Firstly, as, as you said, the area title is um, an old school traditional title that's been been here, you know, probably 80, 90 or 100 years. And it's a title that is, under, you're right, overlooked, like, like a lot of area titles. So but me and myself, I wanted to start off by winning an area title. I, I wanted to go the old school way. So um, firstly, I was very glad and, and um, you know, um, I felt privileged to be fight, to be fighting for the Southern area title. You know, I, I was I was 10 and 0, had eight knockouts. The fight was against, against OJ Abrams who was a big puncher, more experienced than me, you know, been in the game probably eight, nine years longer than me. So, you know, it was, it was a fight at, at um, <coughs> excuse me, in Chesant, in Hertfordshire. And, um, you know, it was my first title fight. I sold a lot, a lot of tickets. I remember being extremely, extremely nervous for the fight. And the fight didn't turn out the way I wanted it to be. Basically, OJ Abrams got disqualified in the first round. Yeah. He um he need me. Yeah. Within within a minute, he need me in the groin. Mm. And um the referees stopped the fight and threw him out. I mean, um, even Frank Warren said afterwards, he should have let him carry on, should have should have warned him and let him carry on. Mm. But let me just say, me, me and OJ became became friends about a year or two after that, after our second fight. And he, he told me, Wayne, I was crapping myself. I was, I was shitting myself the first time I fought you. Um, I was so nervous. Dean Powell, the late Dean Powell, was in was in my corner telling me, telling me, calm down, calm down. You know, you know, just keep composed and take him, take him past four or five rounds. But he said, Wayne, I just I, I crapped myself, and um, all I was thinking about was you knocking me out. So when I got in the corner, it was like it was like a way, it was like a way out. <laughs> was through nerves, through nerves, he done it. You know, so. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like I said, it was an honour to fight for the Southern area and to win it. And it was my first pro title, and it was, you know, it was, it was a great feeling. Fantastic, and that's why I've gone back there because we just walked through a few key fights, and then then we can get into some other things about boxing as a whole. But it's it's a nice place to start. And obviously, I want to give that mention with OJ that you obviously uh, rematched him, yeah. and uh, but the second fight went better, I would say, in terms of there were no knees involved for starters. Um, but there were also, you know, more rounds. So did you feel a sense of satisfaction from beating him? I believe it was third round uh, stoppage in the second fight. But did you feel better that you sort of avenged that, uh, you know, what happened earlier? Or any, any recollections more from what was going through your mind uh, with the second fight than the, than the fight itself, if that makes sense? You know what? I, I felt obviously, obviously better by getting, getting a KO win, you know, getting a proper win. But... Yeah. I was a bit disappointed in myself because OJ put me down twice mm -hmm. in that fight. Funny enough, it came on. It came on Facebook early on today. All my memories, you know, um, the fight was like 21 years ago, and um, for the second fight, I went in the ring a bit overconfident, thinking this guy's going to probably do the same thing again. You know, thinking this guy, this guy, that I want to fight me. You know what I mean? He's gonna, he's gonna, he's, he's gonna, he's gonna bottle it. So I went in there thinking I was gonna blow him away or get need again. <laughs> so um, within the first twenty seconds, no minute, he put me down. Mm. Next thing I look, I look, next thing I looked up, referee is going three, four, five. Jimmy Tibbs looks at me and he goes, "Get up, <laughs> get up." So I got up, as you do. Um, then I put him down about 20 seconds later in the, in the first round. Then I put him down again about two minutes into the first round. So there was there was three knockdowns in the first round. So um, second round came, he put me down again. You know, um, it was quite a heavy knockdown as well. I got up and then got through the round and knocked him out in the third round. So I was happy with the victory, but not with the way it went because... OJ came out a winner. OJ came out in a way more of a winner than me because he put up a great performance. Ian Dark and Jim Watts said, I said, I had great you fought. And, um, you know, people said it, I showed a bit of vulnerabilities, 
but I also showed my heart and desire to get put down and get back up. It was an exciting fight, one of the best fights of the year, and I was I was glad to, you know I was glad to get the win you know, and like and like I said we we became friends about a year later. He came into the gym where I was where I was sparring, and um, Jimmy said to me, "Do you want to spar with OJ?" Um, we didn't really get after that second fight. We didn't really get on because he was still saying he could beat me again. And then um, I said to him, "You know what? Let's have a spar." And we sparred. And it was a good spar. And after that, for the next two, three years, he was my regular sparring partner, you know, and we got on, you know, we had some good spars, you know, and um, I, I, I learned a lot from him. You know, he was, he's, a, he's a big, strong, light middleweight, you know, um, experienced. So, you know, he showed you how the game is, you know, two years, two years before that, we were enemies. And then two years later, we were, we were sparring partners and mates. So, um, yeah. Amazing. It's a really, really good insight into not yeah. just the fact that some of the behind the scenes and some of the other things that go on around, which I think is yeah. absolutely brilliant for the fans. So obviously you can touch on uh, your British title win here as well. Uh, yeah. Because I know it wasn't long afterwards. I know you had a stoppage over uh, George Richards, I believe, after that. But then you fought Paul Samuels um, for the British title. And this was uh, an incredible fight. Obviously, there's a little Welsh connection there as well with, with myself. Yeah. And Paul Stan, like, like we I bet you was cheering over Paul. Come tell the truth. I bet you was cheering over Paul. You never knew me, did you? So I understand. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I was. I remember watching the fight. I mean, I was. I was quite young when that fight happened, mind. But I remember watching the fight, and I was. It was just made the best man win, you know. But yeah. no, Paul's a great guy, and he was uh, a trainer for a long time at, at a gym near to me where Lee Selby trains as well these yeah. days. Uh, and as I say, I know his son, so he's he's a great guy. But. Uh, but no, I mean, there's some fights it's hard to decide because I, I followed your career for a long time. So when the yeah. two of you fought, uh, it was it was difficult to decide. But let's talk about that fight, though. You know, you obviously won the British title, uh, yeah. stoppage win. It was, I mean, what a fight! That was one for the ages, uh, and yeah. it's one that a lot of boxing fans they still talk about today um, as being a great, you know, British fight. So in terms of your recollections from the fight, in terms of the build up, uh, and in terms of the fight itself. Um, let's just talk a little bit about that because, again, you know, winning the Lonsdale belt after uh, yeah. all your sacrifice, all your amateur achievements as well. Uh, you know, it was it was a, a good build up to it in terms of that. But yeah, what do you what do you remember about the fight now that you know that you'd like to share with the fans? And obviously, please tell us how it felt to win as well. Let's let's talk about that. Yes, fighting for the British title was was a dream come true. You know, as a as a eleven year old kid. Boxing as an amateur, watching videos of the likes of Alan Minter and Bear McGuigan and um, you know, Lennox Lewis all win British titles, you know, it was it was something that I um jet off from from an amateur. So for when I was even told I was gonna fight for the British title, you know, it was I was just so excited and you know, um I, I really I really trained hard for the fight, you know, I trained for, for ten weeks for that fight, you know. Um I knew I was fighting Paul Samuels, who was an undefeated fighter himself. I was 10 and 0. Sorry, 10 and 0. I was 13 and 0. And he was 15 and 0. 11 KOs, I had 10 KOs. So from when the fight was called was called on, everyone knew he wouldn't go 12 rounds. Do you know what I mean? I watched Paul progress as a pro. We turned around the same year. So I watched him progress as a pro. He watched me. You know, it was it was a pick and fight, you know, two punches. We'd both been over. I'd been over before, so Paul. So um, on, on the night of the fight, you know, I just, I just remember um, the atmosphere, the, the crowd. I I sold, I must have sold 500 tickets. You know, I'd load I'd about three or four coach loads coming from South South London. He sold probably about the same as well. You know, I think I think half of Newbies must have been there or Newport, should I say? <laughs> you know, um, yeah, just the brilliant atmosphere. Um, I think, again, defence went out the window for both of us. So when the first ball went, it was just two balls collided. You know what I mean? It was just blow for blow. Um, you know, I remember, I remember in round in round one, I remember like him hitting me with a, with a hook and me thinking, "Wow, this guy, this guy can, this guy can whack." You got, you got to be careful, Wayne. Back in that, back in them days, we was wearing eight ounce gloves, eight ounce. You know. Um, so every punch he hit me would hurt me. 
you know, mm-hmm. but I, I, I just wanted to win so bad. It was do or die. I, went, I was not going to come out of that ring a loser, you know. He hit me with shots where maybe a lesser, a lesser fight, I would have gone down. I remember he bust my air jump in the second round. He he with a shot after that. Mm-hmm. And I even say to this day, I was out of, I was out of my feet. You know, I, I do remember being literally out of my feet. And looking back, if he, if he hit me again, I would have been knocked down at least. I know that, you know, I was I was out of my feet. But again, the world to win, my world to win is something that you can't you can't buy. You if you've got it or you haven't, you know. I'm I'm not gonna lose, I'm not gonna lose. So, you know, I just kept on going, kept on going. And I remember um after an onslaught from him in the third round, I came back mm. with a left hook, wobbled him, then put the pressure on him, kept punching, kept punching, kept punching, missed a lot, landed a lot. I always remember I'll always remember if you watch the fight again, I hit him with a left hook. I hit him with a left hook to the body. And that took all the all the life out of him, you know, all all the wind out of him. Watch the watch the replay. A left a left hook to the body, yeah. uh, under the floor, and took all the wind out of him, and he just he kind of like <clears throat> went down like that. He didn't go down, but you can see he, was, he took him out. and landed about another three or four shots. And I landed two big right hands on the ropes, and he landed that he landed that in the ring. But I mean, them blows I landed they were like the hardest I've ever thrown. I think or one of them, and um. You know the feel, the feeling of knowing I won. Money can't buy. You can't. It's hard to explain. You know, it's hard to explain when you've when you've achieved your dreams. You know what I mean? You took, like I say, it was um over twenty odd years. You know, of or fifteen, sixteen years of of, of thinking about winning the Lonzo Bell, and it came true. So um, in my whole twenty five year career, that is up there. You know, probably in the top two or three top two or three moments of my career. You know, it was a brilliant feeling to win the Lonzo belt and I'll never forget it. Incredible. Again, an incredible insight of things the fans have seen, things they haven't seen. Yeah. And I've got to say one final thing about that fight. No matter how many times you watch it, it's always exciting, you know? I mean, I don't know how many times I've seen it. I've seen it several times, but it's always exciting even now. You know, you can still feel the, the atmosphere from that and um, you guys went to war. So... I mean, so, sorry, sorry, the button, oh, British, sorry, the boxing news, they headlined that the British Hagler Yeah. And I mean, that was an honour. I mean, obviously, everyone knows about Hagler yeah. but they called that the British Hagler which it was, you know what I mean? It was a British version of that. I mean, you know, we, were, we weren't as good as them, but to, to even, for them to even mention them two names along me, you know what I mean? I was, I was proud of that. And, um, you know, it was a great, a great, a great moment, a great moment. Mm. It certainly was, absolutely. So we can move on now to another big one here that I'm really excited to talk about, your first uh, world title challenge. Um, because I know, obviously, after the British title, you had the first final stoppage of Paul Denton. I remember that one a little bit. But then yeah. you, you moved into a world title challenge against Harry Simon for the yeah. title. Uh, again, that was another brilliant fight. Obviously, that one... Uh, didn't go your way. So with some no. of these, I tried to pick the highs and the lows, you know, because of, course, of, course. of any legendary career. But I'd like to talk about that one a little bit from starting with before the fight, you know, starting when, um, you know, you first got the call, you first became aware of the fact you were going to be fighting for a world title. And I want to do that because I want to go just behind the scenes a little bit before we get to the fight itself. So what was the build-up like for you in terms of training, in terms of um, mental preparation, you know, how you felt going into the fight, everything. Just give us a little feel for what went on sort of behind the scenes on the build-up, please, chat. That'd be great. And this is, this is my first world title fight, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, if you if you uh, remember, it was a 24 hours job. Mm-hmm. I, I, I was literally going to a friend's house. Mm-hmm. I was going to a friend's house and I got a phone call from the late Ernie Fossey. The late Ernie Fossey gave me a phone call, said, Wayne, Harry Simon's opponent has pulled out of a fight tomorrow in witness. Do you want to fight? First of all, I thought he was joking. I thought we were having, I thought we were having a laugh. I said, I said um, you sure? He said, yeah, look, Wayne, you know, he's pulled out. We need someone to come up now 
to weigh in or fight him. What's your weight like? I said, my weight's all right. I'm near the weight. And um, I said, well, how much are you going to pay me? <laughs> you know what I mean? Carry Simon was a, a fire that I was looking looking at and thinking I could fight him in the next three or four years. You know what I mean? Not tomorrow. I said, oh, how much am I going to get? It may be an offer. I um, called my trainer, Jimmy Tibbs, told him. He, he, thought, he thought I was joking at first. I said, no. T- told him what it was. He said, Wayne, he said, ask for more, mate. Ask for more. <laughs> ask for some more. So I, I back him up, back up Ernie. I said, look, we'll take the fight, but we want more. He's like, oh, Wayne, Wayne, Wayne. Because they, we, want more, we want more. So he's made an offer. I've gone back to Jimmy. Jimmy said, no, Wayne, try and get some more, Wayne. I said, you know what? You're right. <laughs> You're right. They was desperate. They was, the show was going to be held the following day. You witness. With Michael Gomez and... And um, Harry Simon top in the bill, yeah. Um, so we we made the phone call again. I said, "Look, make me another offer. There may be an offer which I accepted." I said, "You know, this is Wayne. Get up here, ASAP." Witness. It was it was it was the afternoon morning time. So basically, I, I made some phone calls, phoned my friends and close family members, and told them all about it. And um, about three of them came down in the motor, drove me to witness, you know, it took us about four hours up to witness. Um, l- luckily, I was I was in training for a fight in about a month's time, so my weight was all right, but I wasn't I wasn't prepared for a world title fight, you know what I mean? So, basically, um, went up to up to witness, um, made the weight, lost, lost a few pounds, got the weight down, weighed in. You know, it was still, I was still like, you know, like it was happening so quickly, I couldn't believe what was going on. So, um, got up next morning, you know, I had got some food down me. Um, the whole, by this time, the whole boxing boxing world knew what was going on. Wayne Alexander was fighting out something for the world top for the world title, you know what I mean? And, um, all my friends and family were, you know, were, we're, gonna, we're gonna watch it on TV. Come, come fight time, come fight time, you know what. I'll tell you one thing. I, I went in the fight thinking I could win, you know, thinking I had the power to knock him out. You know, I, ne- I never for one moment, moment thought, you know what, I'm getting a payday. I'm just going to go in there and fall down. You know, I went in there to win. The first bill came out, you know, I came out hard and fast. Um, you know, but within the first minute, I realised what world level is about. You know, it, it throw like spurts of punches, brrr, heavy and hard. You know what I mean? I'm like, wow, you know what I mean? Like, this is like, you know what I mean? A bit different to what I'm used to, but I withstood the first round. Second round came out. I remember turning southpaw because you know, I'm a fighter that can box both ways. I turned southpaw and threw a, threw a right hook and I, I wobbled him. The crowd went wild, you know what I mean? Like, I wobbled Harry Simon. You know, he wobbled for about two or three seconds. I, you know, I, I attacked him, tried to get tried to get him out. Couldn't. Um, you know, um, I really give it to him. You know, what I mean, I, I reckon a lesser champion would have gone down. You know, he was he was a good fighter. You know, um, round three and round four, he probably won them rounds, even though I held in there. And by round five, I was um, I was told I was I was running out of steam. I was running out of steam, and he hit me in the body shot, which put me down. I got up, and um, after another after another onslaught, the referee stopped it. And I, I was genuinely, I was genuinely upset, you know, because um, even though I got a good payday, I didn't go, there, I didn't go in the ring for the money. I went there to win and to become world champion. Mm. But I must say, I must say, Harry Simon, he showed me what world class is all about, you know. He had power, he had speed, he had strength, he had a good chin. He was, he was the best fighter I've, I've ever fought. Even though I wasn't hundred percent fit for him, but just by what he showed me, he showed me what it is to to be a world champion, you know. And um, it was a good experience. You know, I think it made me a better fighter losing losing that. Brilliant. Another thing to touch on here, I mean, obviously by this time you were representing uh, London on the world stage and obviously you'd already yeah. been on. You know, I want to talk a little bit about your about your following here and just, just deviate from specific fights and we'll go back to that in, in a moment. But just yeah. sort of touch on... Uh, what it means to you to be representing, you know, your city and your area on the world stage, you know, by this level. Obviously, you were already 
um, doing that as an amateur and through your pro career. Yeah. But just pick this level because by the time you got here, you you know you were doing this on the on the world stage, and earlier you were talking about 400, 500 tickets. Talk us through a little bit about some of the support that you you had at that time uh, and what it was like. You know, even I'd imagine you probably just got stuck walking down the street and everybody knew you in your area. But I don't really have a, a narrow question about this, but just what does it mean to you to, to you know put um, London on the map in your own way and your own area? Uh, and just anything you'd like to say about about that side of things, because the support you had, um, I mean, I, I remember you had support from different areas. I mean, it wasn't just yeah. London, but obviously that's bound to be important to you because that's where you're from. So anything you'd like to share about the, the fan support you received locally, just to sort of hone in on that aspect of it, please, champ. That would be great. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the, the fans are, are a, major port, a major part of the sport, you know. Of you know um, of the occasion, you know having 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 a brilliant atmosphere, you know makes 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 the fight or makes the scene even even better. So um, having a good following can spur you on to you know to um, to perform even better. You know what I mean when the chips are going down and you and you hear the, you hear the crowd roaring for you, it can make you you know that extra give you that extra strength that ambition. I mean I'm I'm from Croydon. South London, and obviously I started boxing as a as a ten eleven year old. So from the age of ten eleven, people knew I boxed, you know. Um, and as you get more successful and more attention, more people want to know you, you know. So from from I say from well, from a young boy, I mean I, I had followers. I mean not as much, but from when I was yeah eleven twelve, you know, winning national titles and boxing at venues like your core, I, I did have always have support, you know. Even like you know, my club mates would come with their family and friends. Like I would, I would be there fighting. So I've I've had decent support from when I was 11, 12 from Croydon, and like you say, as you said, as you expand and, and become um, a TV fighter and a pro, you get people that know people, and you know what I mean, like just general fans who don't know you. You know what I mean, like 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 I said a lot. I mean, we we need to become a top champion. Half of the half of the fans that come there and cheer your name don't know you personally, but you know they they are still fans of yours. So having fans is a, is a is a big part of um of a boxer's career. So yeah, I, I appreciate the support I had, and um yeah, Croydon's Croydon's where I'm from. I don't live there now, but when I fought, when I fought for all my title fights, I you know had a lot of fans from Croydon come to watch me. A lot of the press, the local press, backed me. So having having fans was a was a, a big inspiration for my career, and I do thank my fans for for being there for me. You know, for the good and the bad times. You know, because mm. when I when I lost, they still supported me afterwards. You know what I mean? Yeah, very much. And that was that was also something I remember was was the loyalty. You know, um, yeah, all well, that really really showed itself. I think uh, in your career, but yeah, I mean the fans they, they definitely deserve a mention uh, in general. But you had some really great fans. So it's good to, to sort of touch on that. Um, obviously, you won the, the European title uh, at your call again. Yeah. Now, your call was, we'll get to the European title now, but your call was obviously a venue you fought at a lot, the Mecca of Boxing, incredible, yeah. uh, incredible place. Now, was that your sort of favourite venue in terms of the crowd, in terms of the atmosphere, or what have you, um, personally, or really got you charged up to fight? Or was there another venue... Um, that you prefer because I know you you boxed at your call probably more than ten times I think you know, during your career uh, certainly yeah. a lot of fights there so does that one stand out in your mind as as being your favorite place or, or was there another place that you you enjoyed the most in terms of the crowd support in terms of the atmosphere that was created um, and what have you and it's sort of another question about the fans themselves really because obviously different venues they they translate differently I mean the the big venues have one type yeah. of atmosphere. Your call has a very special atmosphere of mine. But, you know, in, in your own words, Chad, where, where was your favourite venue to, to actually fight in uh, in terms of the crowd and so on? For, for a London fighter, I think I think most London fighters, their favourite London venue would be your call. And I, I would have to agree and say, you know, my favourite London venue was your call. I first, I first boxed there as a junior as a junior in 1990 mm. to become London junior champion. 
And I knew about your call five, ten years before that. And you know, used to watch fights on TV. So that was a, that was like a little dream, even even boxing at your call. So for most for, for me, London, your call was was the number one venue. You know, Wembley Wembley Arena Arena, you know, was also you know a nice, is a nice venue. It's called the SSE now. I think it's called. It's changed name a few times, but Wembley Wembley Arena is you know is a nice a nice venue for boxing. You know. Um, the Royal, the Royal Albert Hall, you know, I never, I never got to box team. That's one, that's one thing I, re, I regret about the, the, the famous London venues. I never, I never boxed at um, the Royal Albert Hall. I went there a couple of times, but I never boxed there. But I, I would say your call, you know, is is our um, every London fighters place to, to be. You know, um, the atmosphere, you know, it's, it's not too big, it's not too small, the way it's shaped, you know, um, and just just the history of it. Most, most, especially most London world champs from the, from the past fifty years have boxed there. You know, um, most top level pros over the past fifty years have at least had one fight there. So it's the most popular fight venue in London. So I'm glad to have boxed there. You know, like I said, probably ten times amateur and pro. Absolutely incredible. So yeah, it's another thing that that's a good highlight because I know you you boxed all over, but. Uh... It's good to give that a mention as well. So what I was saying before, so the European title is another good one to talk about uh, before we get to, obviously, WBU uh, world title and uh, Takalu and everything there. But first, we've we got to touch on the European because that's a tremendous achievement, the European title in, in itself. And it was another, um, obviously, early stoppage as well. So again, with this with this fight, you know, um, how did it feel to win the European? You know, what do you remember about the fight itself and just... Again, anything anything you'd like to share with the fans about this one that they may already know, they may not know. Um, but obviously, it was your fight. So, in your own words, champ, European title. Walk us through that one, please. Right. I think I think most people remember that that night. I was top of the bill, mm. but unofficially, Johnny Tapia was top of the bill because mm. that was the first time that Johnny Tapia boxed in England you know yeah. so I was I was I was I was completely I was honoured I was so excited that Johnny Tapia was going to box on the same bill as me you know um, I was fighting for a great title traditional title the EBU title you know um, I remember seeing Johnny Tapia at the weigh-in and you know what I mean like even though I said I was top of the bill but everyone was there to see Johnny so um, I was I was excited because I was going to fight for the EBU and also Johnny was going to fight as well. So um, I remember, I always remember wishing as well sometimes that I wish I could have watched Johnny live because when Johnny came in the ring, I was in the changing room getting my hands wrapped up. And I can remember the changing room almost like shaking, you know, like with a roar for Johnny Tapia, thinking like, you know, I mean, I'd, love to, I'd love to be there watching him live. I was down to getting my hands wrapped. But that's a that's a always something that I remember. Um, and yeah, winning the, the EBU title was another another great um, achievement of achievement of mine. You know, becoming a EBU champion made me number ten in the um, rankings of all the um, governing world governing bodies. You know, um, I beat a decent fire in, in Paolo Pizzamiglio. Who was an Italian champion? He made four defenses of his title, so he was a decent, decent European, decent Italian champion, decent European level fighter. Mm. So, yeah, winning the EBU title is is, an, is another one of my great nights because Johnny Tapia was on my undercard, if you know what I'm saying. Um, so, like all all the um, people in in the know was there. All the top boxing reporters boxing writers, media was there for that night. And um I was always you know, I always tell people I got into the I got into the Ring magazine the following month, because Johnny Tappy obviously was there. So they had Amer they had the Amer you had the American press there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I got a picture in the um Ring magazine the following month. You know, um just saying that when Alexander boxed on the Tapia on the Tapia bill, you know, so yeah, it was, a, it was a great memory. It was a great memory. One of my, one of my best as a pro, as a pro, one of my best best evenings because because Johnny Tapia 
made that special night for me, you know. Mm-hmm. I watched Johnny Tapia fight from when he turned pro back in like 91, 90, you know. So I watched I watched Johnny Tapia fight for like for like 10 years. I knew all about it. I knew all about his history, his life. And yeah, it was just it was a great, a great honor to box on the same bill as the late Johnny Tapia, you know. And may may he rest in peace. May you rest in peace indeed. He's a great champion and uh, a wonderful achievement for yourself as well. Definitely one to highlight. Uh, just incredible on many counts. Obviously, with this, we, you know, we get to, to the big one. Um, or, yeah. you know, uh, I think, obviously, when you won the WBU title, uh, world title against Takalu, that was a knockout for the ages, obviously. And I think um, everyone remembers that fight. People know about that fight in all corners of boxing. It still comes up on the internet all the time. Um, if you ever see those uh, compilations and the you know, top knockouts or, you know, the, the best fights of such and such a year or whatever, you know, it's, it's always out there somewhere. So I think um, I think pretty much every boxing fan knows what happened. But I still want to sort of look back on that because that was an incredible achievement. Um, the way you stopped him, I mean, he was out cold. Just just the whole the whole fight was exciting. Um, yeah. You know, obviously he's such a tremendous fighter himself. You know, the two of you yeah. had, was just wonderful. So... Um, in your own words, champ, with that, let's talk a little bit about the fight. Uh, obviously, give a mention to the to the stoppage itself because I'm curious to know when you hit him if you knew in that moment he was going to be out, you know, as, as much as he was, or if it took a minute to sink in. Uh, be curious to know about that. But just anything that you you'd like to share about it, really, because this was really, I'm not going to say the pinnacle because it, you had some really great moments in your career all the way, but it's certainly a pinnacle of of your career, I would say. So. Yeah, um, share it away, champ. Share it away on this incredible achievement winning the WBU World Title, please. Yeah, listen, you know, I said it. I said it before, and I'll say, you know, forever. I mean, the, the Takalu fight defined my career. Mm-hmm. You know, that is if that is the, that is the defining fight of my twenty-five year fight career. You know, mm-hmm. um, me and Takalu had, had history. We, we we trained together for about three years in the same gym with Jimmy Tibbs, so we trained we trained together. And um, Takalu, I think he'd even admit it was, I wouldn't say not jealous, but I was I turned pro with, um, with a bit more um, what's the word following or backing than he did. I was a better amateur and more of a prospect then. So with Takalu was always a bit in the background, you know what I mean, like, behind me. He was a good fighter, I must say, but you know what I mean, I was always the one who people thought was going to be the champion. And we were, we were the same weight. We were the same weight as well. So whenever whenever we sparred, whenever we sparred, Takalu would cheat you like he was a world title fight because he had something to prove, you know what I mean? So he'd really be up for it all the time. And we'd have, we'd have you know, decent spars. He was... He, we had some good spars, mate. You know, sometimes he, he got a better of me, sometimes I got a better of him. You know, most of them I got a better of him, but he got a better of me sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we had some good spars. And then um, I told this, I told this story some thousands of times, but I'll say it again. One day I came into the gym and um, I didn't feel I didn't really feel like training. You know, you get in days where you just don't feel like doing much, but you get you just you just go through it, get through it. And Jimmy goes to me, give Tackle a spa, take a little wants to have a little spa. So I was like, I don't really feel like sparring, you know, Jimmy. Jimmy goes, just, just, just give him a little spar. Go on, spar with him. What's the So anyway, I put the gloves on. <laughs> put the gloves on. You know, get ready. Jimmy goes, put the bell, put the bell on. Come out. Next minute, boom. Tackler, Tackler just jumped on me. Put me down. In the gym. He put me down. Bam. Jimmy again goes, get up. <laughs> Look to me, goes, get up. Got up. Carried on sparring. Yeah, carried on sparring. And done about two more rounds later. I was gutted, as you would be. Tackle was walking around the gym with a big smile on his face. You know what I mean? Like, I put Welling's arm down. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, I'm never going to live this down. And long story short, Tackle fought about a week or two later. And he got beat. He was a bit of an upset. It was his, it was his first defeat. And then um, when he got beat, he made an excuse like a lot of fighters do. They blame, they blame the trainer. He was saying, uh, Jimmy Tibbs is 
you know, he puts more time in Wayne and, you know I mean, um, he's not training me like how he trains Wayne and, you know, I, you know I mean, like basically he left Jimmy and got another trainer. Yeah, that was the excuse. And and then what it was from, from then, when he left Jimmy, he went with another trainer and all he would say to people was, I'm better than Wayne Alexander. I, kn- I knocked him out, yeah. I, I can beat Wayne. I knocked him out. He never knocked me out. He knocked me down. But he, from then on, all he said was, I'm better than Wayne. You know, I know, I know, I know he's a prospect and everyone's talking about him, but I, I can beat him. I knocked him out. But going back, he, he fails to remember the week after he knocked me out, we sparred, we sparred again. Yeah? We sparred again. And I give him a good idea. <laughs> yeah? He forgets that. The week after we sparred, I give him a good idea. After about three rounds, Jimmy goes, stop sparring, stop sparring. And he said to Takalu, well, you're all right, you're all right, are you all right, Takalu? Takalu goes, yes, I'm all right. All right. And Jimmy goes, continue. And I put it on him again, give him another hiding. I didn't put, I didn't put him down, but I give him a good hiding. And Jimmy goes, stop sparring, stop sparring, <laughs> stop it. So Takalu was basically, he was stopped. So he got out of the ring, like, at the arm, you know what I mean? But if he gets that, if he gets that moment, you know, I told everybody that he knocked me down. I, I, once, I, once, heard, I once heard a rumour that I was knocked out and carried out on a stretcher. That's, <laughs> that's how party went. I was I was knocked out in the gym and I had to be carried out, you know what I mean? But he, he put me down. But anyway, Takalu improved. He gets over about a three year like no, this because over about a four year period. He, he improved, he, he done well. He beat he beat Anthony Farnell, remember? Which mm-hmm. was a massive shock. Everyone thought he get he get beat. Tak Farnell was undefeated. You know, he kept talking my name, kept talking my name. And um again, long story short. The fight was made. <laughs> the fight was made. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's a fight which I could not lose. Takalu was speaking so much for the past four or five years, how he knocked me out, yeah? That's all he kept talking about, how he knocked me out and he'd do it again. He told everyone, everyone, everyone knew about it. Everyone knew that Takalu knocked me out from Takalu. Do you know what I mean? And I, I just could not lose to Takalu. I've always said it. I'd rather, I'd rather have died than lost to him. I mean, that fight, I just couldn't lose. I mean, if I'd lost that fight, that would have been it, wouldn't it? He would have said he knocked me out in the gym and he knocked me out for rules. <laughs> I mean, that would have been it. So, long story short, I I um, got a new trainer. I wanted a new, I wanted a new focus. I wanted a new mindset. You know, I wanted something new. I went to Ireland with John Breen. John Breen was there with Eamon McGee, Jim Rock, Paul McCluskey, Neil Sinclair, Martin Rogan, good bunch of fighters, you know. A great sparring. I was running the mountains of Armagh in County Armagh. New, um, yeah, um, they call it Bandit Country. You know, I was um, training hard. I went away, I went away for, 10, for 10 weeks. I trained for 10 weeks for that fight. You know, I never felt better. And come fight time I'll always, I'll always remember it's like again for the for the Takalu fight I think I felt better than the Paul Samuels fight because I was so I was more I was so mentally prepared where I just couldn't lose because it was so personal and you know the first round you know was even, even money first round you know the second round came for the first minute I um, pushed him back with a shot and I uh, you know, he's, he's been shown a million times. I, I I went I went for a right hand. I hit him, but not properly. And as I, as, I, as I've come back, he's hit me with the left up to the body, which hurt me. Took all the wind out of me. I'm not gonna lie, it hurt me. Like you know, I wasn't I wasn't expecting it. It's the one you it's the one you don't see that hurt you as well. So took all the wind out of me, and I've backed up back backed up here, yeah, like to get some recovery. And I see I see him coming to like finish me off. I see him coming like he half, he half, kind of, he half smile. I can never forget it. He half like kind of like grin. So yeah, I've got you now. And like there's a shot that I always practice with Jimmy Tibbs for years. You know, for like I'm talking like eight nine years, I practiced that shot. And then um, done it with John Breen. The roll. You know, where I got it from Nigel Ben. Used to like it. Nigel Ben used to roll left on. You know, that's shot. That's one of his shots. Now, I remember seeing Tag Luke come in to finish me. And I said, like, no, I said, yeah, all right, then here's your opening. So like, I rolled a shot, threw the left hook, it landed straight on the chin. And again, I said that a thousand, I said that a thousand times. 
it's, it's a feeling which only a certain people love. You know that feeling when people say to you like everything goes everything goes slow. Have yeah. you heard that before? I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. Like in, a, in a moment in your life, whether it's, it's a tragedy or, or an exciting moment, man, for a split seconds things just seem to go slow. Yeah. And I remember like catching him, and him like obviously like head, you know, him being out. I can remember like looking at him and just you know like smiling so you know like within laughing within and and walking to the corner and then the rest is history what can I say I mean like you know what I mean that's like it was the rest is history you know um I remember sorry I remember when he went down the referee just waved it off straight away I can never forget it the referee straight he waved it off straight away and I went <gasps> that is how that is how um much the body shot hurt me because I wanted, I wanted to win so badly that initial me rolling the shot, I, I could have I could have gone down then. You know, if he hit me, if he hit me again, I would have gone down. Without a doubt, I would have gone down. So I always remember when the referee waved it over, me gasping for breath where I was where I was winded. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a weird, it's a weird kind of feeling, Liam. Like, only I can explain it. You know what I mean? It's a weird. Them them like ten seconds were just it's that it was like weird. I mean like. It's like I was. It's like I was meant to win, you know. He's like, you know, what I mean, it's like somebody was looking down on me then, you know. Um, it was, it was, you know, I never felt nothing like that before or afterwards. And um, the rest is history, you know. Um, funny enough, it was seventeen years ago last week. It was seventeen years ago last week. You know, time it's a, you know, I mean, time just flown. Seventeen years. Do you know what I mean? Um, um, and like you say, it's it's the fight that defined my career. That the two minutes of my whole twenty five year career, they're the two minutes that defined it. Yeah. So incredible. And with that, I mean, with everything you shared there, you shared so yeah. much. It's just an incredible story. No matter how many times you hear it, no matter how many times you see the fight, I mean, it's just it's just incredible. And the achievement itself is just it's remarkable. I have to ask though. I mean, in terms of the two of you now, obviously, there was that rivalry then, and there yeah. was some sort of bitterness there from, you know, it sounds like from his side, and there were these things going on. I mean, do you see much of him these days, or I mean, what, what's the situation with that? Like, do you, do you guys ever speak, or uh, was it just sort of left? You know, you got the upper hand, you beat him, and, and that was the end of everything. If you get where I'm coming from with this one, to, to, to tell you the truth, in 17 years. I've seen Takalu, I think, five times, literally five, maybe six, in 17 times, 17 years, sorry. I mean, two big reasons. One, Takalu lives in Margate. Mm-hmm. And I'm obviously, I'm in South London, so, you know, 78 miles away. So I'm always residing in London, you know. Yeah. So I don't, I don't really, I don't go, I don't think I've been to Margate. I think, I think I've been to Margate once in 17 years, so I don't go to Margate. And he hasn't got much in London. And secondly, Tackle is Tackle is not um is not a big fan of the game like me. See me, mm-hmm. I, I was a boxing fan before I well just the time I started boxing, I was a boxing fan. You know, you, you know, you got fighters that are fans of the game, like myself. I'm a fan of the game. You know, I watch it regular, uh, you know, um, I'm on the internet all the time. So I am a boxing fan where Tackle is not really a boxing fan. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So even when I've been I've been to shows, even like maybe like a Liverpool a couple of times or Manchester, he's never been there. He's not really a big fan of the game. So mm-hmm. um, them two reasons are reasons why. And, and, and I must admit, also I think the type of times I have seen him, he ain't really be close. I mean, I must I must admit, there's only a, there's only a couple of guys who have boxed in out of 100 fights. There's only, there's only a couple of guys who. I would say that we're not we're not really pally pally afterwards. You know, I've, I've 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 had guys knock me out. You know, as an amateur, and me and them speak like we're, like we're best friends when I see him. But me and Tackle, no, you're right. It's, we never be friends. Then, you know what I mean? I'm not saying that I don't dislike it, but we never we you know, we never click. You know, what I mean that fight that fight devastated him. You know, mentally, you know, um, it destroyed him. You know, like. I don't think it was to be me and my friend either, actually. <laughs> well, no, so we're not we're never be friends, which that's that's um neither here or there. I mean I, I do hear things, I do hear he's co- I think he's coaching. Um 
doing a bit of coaching and that. I mean, I don't wish you no, I don't wish you no harm. I don't, I don't hate the man, but you know, we just we won't be friends. You know, I don't think. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's the way it goes sometimes. Yeah, right? yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Very much, yeah. Brilliant. All right then. So moving on to obviously now more towards the uh, the end of your career. We like I see we've touched on a few big fights and and we've yeah. touched on as you say what defined your career and then we'll get to the end of your career and then there's one or two other things about boxing as as a whole sport. But you know, basically the question and, and this might seem sort of obvious or sort of not, but when the time came to call it a day, um, and obviously this is a few fights later after winning the world title because you still had some some very good fights after that but when the time did come to sort of call it a day and you know hang them up and, and all that sort of thing obviously your, your very last fight um it didn't go very well but before that you still <laughs> had some, some good that's one way of putting it but you you had some very good wins though i mean you were still on, on great form i remember uh i remember watching quite a few so one of the things is i mean every fighter knows uh, and just because that fight, that last very last fight of your career went that way, it wouldn't have stopped yeah. some. Some guys would still come back after that and sure, still think. Sure. In that. I've seen quite a few, um, and you sort of think, well, I, I don't know, but you know, they, they still think. And, and obviously, it's an old uh, cliche: people not knowing when to quit and people coming yeah. back over. And obviously, recently we had the whole um, Amanda Holyfield thing and on and on. But there's lots of local um, British uh, examples yeah. of. So you obviously personally knew it was it was time, you know, when the time came. Um, can you sort of walk us through any aspects you'd like to share about that in terms of the decision, what the decision was like to make, and um, obviously that transition because boxing has been your whole life for decades, and then obviously the decision to sort of um, hang them up and, and not compete, uh, and obviously you said you found the, the rush and the buzz again with referee and judging and so forth. Yeah. But at the time, it kind of been an easy decision at all. So. Can you sort of walk us through um, sort of what was going on in your life at that time and, and just how you knew it was time to hang them up and just anything you'd like to share about that that aspect, really, Chad, would be, be brilliant. Yeah, do you know what? I, I, I mean, just trying to adjust this um, because the battery is bloody low and I, and I put the charger in. Mm. Um, like, I can still uh, see it. Yeah, listen, um, I... And many people would know I um I wasn't the most dedicated of trainers, you know. I, I um I I would have I would have long spells out out of out of the ring where I, I would train for a fight, you know, eight, ten weeks, twelve weeks for a fight. Then afterwards I wouldn't train, you know, I'd um I wouldn't um live the live the life, do you know what I mean? Um and I'd put on weight and then I'd come back to the gym and have to lose like two stone. Mm. And the last couple of years of my career, after the Takaloo fight, I um I wouldn't say that I wouldn't say lost interest, but I never I know I must admit I, I never I never trained as hard as I did for a fight as Takaloo. So I wouldn't say he wasn't a decline because you know I, I could have done better. I should have done better, I think. But um like I said, um the dedication and the focus wasn't as great as it should have been. And when I got that defeat, something in me was, how can I put it, I was disappointed, but not as disappointed as I should have been. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and that showed me that Wayne is not there no more, you know? Um, that showed me that Wayne, perhaps it's time you go, you know? You, I could have gone on for a couple more years, but I know I would have been, I would have been a win some, lose some fire. Do you know what I mean? I know that I would have been, I would have been a win some, lose some. I would have been a bit of an opponent. And again, to me, losing was everything. I could not lose. I would lose him was like death to me. You know what I mean? Some some fighters like, get to a stage where they don't mind losing because they're getting paid, which is fair enough. Money, money talks. But I would I wouldn't want to fight just for money. Mm. If you know what I mean? I wouldn't want to get beat just for money. So I decided, I mean, again, I I lost my fight in two in 20, 20, 20, 2006. But um, I only said I only announced my retirement to the president that in 2008. So for about mm. 18 months, I was I was still, I mean, an army, half training, half not. Do you know what I mean? Um, and yeah, you know, I just decided, you know what, Wayne, you're not going to live the life. You're not going to. You're not going to. You don't. You don't. You don't. You don't want it. Yeah. So better you just pack it in. You, you know what I mean? You've had a decent career. 
you know, I would have liked, I would have liked to, to have won a major world title, you know. I would like to have been involved in some major, major, major fights. You know, um, when I was fighting, when I was in my prime from, I'll say, 2002 to 2004, you had the likes of, you had the likes of De La Hoya, Vargas, Trinidad, you know what I mean? I'm not saying I would have beaten them guys, you know what I mean? But even even to be in the ring with them guys would have been an honour. Do you know what I mean? Even just to beat the sheer ring. I mean, I, 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 always, I always fancied um, Fernando Vargas. Do you remember him? Yeah. Fernando Vargas, like, he was a good fighter. He would have he would have been favoured to beat me. I'm not disputing that. I'm saying that's that's the kind of level I thought I could have mixed in. I mean, um you you know, remember Uruguay campus? Yeah. He was a decent fighter I thought I could have mixed with. So you know, um I missed out on them, them big international fights. And you know, I thought, Wayne, you know what? You done you, you done all right. You know, leave it. Don't I never I never ever wanted to be a fighter that that loses, you know. Another eight, nine, ten times before you finally realize it, you know, I mean, it's over. So that was it, you know. I just said, you know, when I quit, and sometimes I always, I always have a laugh with some of my pals and say, you know, a lot of fighters who come back, it's because they they keep training and their mind, their, their body, their mind telling them they're fit and they're ready, but their body's not. Do you know what I mean? And that's why a lot of guys fight still because they're still fit. But because I don't, I don't do no training, I'm not, I'm not in all good shape, I won't, I won't come back. I wouldn't have come back in the first four or five years because I wasn't doing nothing. I wasn't making myself believe that I had it. You know what I mean? So, in that way, in that sense, I'm glad I didn't keep in keep in the um, keep in the gym because I would have maybe thought I'd have another go. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Totally, so, yeah. Um, so basically, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. Like you say, um, well, it's been 50, 50, 14 years now. So, um, I still love the game. I'm, I'm a fan of boxing. I always love boxing. I, I, you know, I paid for the fight the other night. Usyk, Usyk, Joshua. You know, I love, I love boxing. It's, it's my first love. I always say it's, it's my first love. And um, you know, I, I'm a referee and judge now. You know, so I'm still involved in, in boxing in certain ways. Um, like you said, I get interviews from yourself, which I appreciate. You know, um, so people still know I'm about. So you know, that's, that's, you know, that's enough for me. Everyone has a career. Everyone, everyone's career comes to an end as well. You know what I mean? Everyone's career doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I mean, whoever you are, little little Campbell Hatton who fought the other day. Yeah. In the next ten years, he won't be. He won't be about Willie. Yeah, you know, I'm just saying how time just goes. Jimmy Tibbs told Jimmy Tibbs told me and Danny Williams once, your career will just flash before you like that. You know what I mean? He's so right. You know that was that's 25 years ago. He told me that. 1995. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Listen, you know, I've got to um, just accept, you know, what, what I've done and what I did do and move forward, you know. I'm a, I'm a dad now. I'm a, I'm a granddad now. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, life has to go on, you know. Very much, very much. Well, it's been a brilliant insight into your career. I mean, the last yeah. the last thing that I really have, um, that's, that's good with the lighting as well, the last thing I really have is obviously – just to touch on boxing today, because you mentioned, uh, obviously we mentioned earlier what you're personally doing today, but you've also touched on being a quite a big boxing fan still and watching a yeah. lot of fun, being very involved. What, do, what are your thoughts on, you know, where boxing is at today? I know this is this is a big question. Yeah, um, it is. <laughs> in general, you know, compared to your day, because there, there's everything from, you know, smaller things like changes in, in the gloves and all that sort of thing to changes yeah. in uh, actual uh, obviously now we've got like all the YouTube fights going on and we've got yeah. other things like that happening. There's competition from you know UFC and bare knuckle fighting and all sorts of other things that weren't around most of the time when you were fighting. And then, you know, there's different things like that. But just in general, in terms of the quality of the champions, because uh, I still think there's great fights and great fighters and everything like that. But obviously the sport has changed in, in some aspects. And I know this is a very big, uh, big question, but it'd be the last thing because you, you still seem very passionate about the sport. You still seem yeah. very... Which is not always the case. I mean, I, I do interview some champions and, and they, they don't really follow it now, you know, but you're still... True, yeah. It. That is true. That is true, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. Your thoughts on, on the sport now, basically? Any, anything you'd like to say? You know what? Listen, um, a lot of fighters will always say their time was the best. You know, um, I, I would say my era... The 90s was a great time for boxing. But, you know, I, I like guys who were 
20 years older than me, they would say the 60s and 70s were the best times. You know what I mean? So I suppose when you're, in, when, you're, when you're actually involved in it, it's a great time for you. Um, but in my eyes, it's changed where I think personally it's, it's, it, was, it was harder in my days to become a champion. I'm not, I'm not discrediting anyone now. But again, people older than me say it was, it was harder for them, which is true. You know, back in the 60s and 50s, you fought for the British title once and that would be it. You never get a shot. Now, you could fight twice, three times for it, in, 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 once a year. Do you know what I mean? So there's more, there's more opportunities, though, which is a good thing. There's more opportunities for fighters so they can earn, money, earn more money. The money's, the money's better now. Mm. So then that's, that's another good thing. So it's changing good and bad. I mean, social media has, has just taken over. That's just that's taken over the whole world. You know what I mean? You know, um, you could put, you could put this video out tomorrow, and it could get a million hits. A million hits. Mm. That'd be good for you. But that make you that make you famous overnight. I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying. I'm just saying how social media is. You got guys who. Ain't that good, or wouldn't have been any good in my time? Who are, who are more famous than I am now, and uh, they're not as good as me. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm just saying now, times have changed in a good way as well for them people because obviously if social media was around now. I'd be a massive name as well. So it's worked good and bad. I mean, I can't, I can't see, and it's so fast now. Everything is so fast now. I mean, again, I remember the last of Jimmy Tibbs telling me when he was fighting, and like you know, yeah, you had the main event. And the undercard fights, you wouldn't you wouldn't know who who's won the undercard fights until the following day. You know, in the papers, in a little little snippet. Now, in it, internet, boom. You know, from the from the four rounder fighting in front of twenty people, his fights on his fights on social media like that straight away. Someone filmed it. You know what I mean? Um, so it, it's it's worked, it's worked, it's worked out good and bad in in both ways. Um, but I I, I just believe in my area in my era. Fights were, were better. You had less titles. You know, when I when I was towards the end of my career, that's when the intercontinental titles and international titles started to come become a bit bigger. You know, I, I remember in the eighties, it was just strictly Southern area, British, European, and world, wasn't it? In the eighties, in the late eighties, started getting WBC and national and this and that. So, you know, but like I said, I mean, it, lesser fighters who are not that good can still earn money, can't they? You know, mm. so, you know, guys who guys who train hard and work hard, they deserve to earn money as well, don't they? So you know, it swings around about three, really, isn't it? I mean, um, the game the game has changed for the better and the worse. I'd say both, a bit of both. Well, yeah, I agree. I agree very much. But yeah. it's really good to get your take on things because you know you've been there, you've you've done it all and a bit of everything, and you know, yeah. the heights and everything. So it's uh, it's really good to get an insight. Well. You know, champ. I think uh, we, you know, we've talked about a lot of things, uh, and we've yeah. gone really in depth and uh, done really, really well with it. I think, and I really think that this has sort of exceeded uh, my expectations. I knew it would be a very good talk, but we've really gone sort of in depth into things, which is which is fantastic, and it will give the fans a really good insight into uh, into yourself, your career, and what you're doing now, and you're looking back on on your fights. And there's so many things in there. So, I mean, really, the last thing for me to do is, is just to say a big thank you, obviously, for, for coming on the show. A uh, big thank you for sharing everything that you've shared, being so open and um, so honest. I know that's the type of person you are, but it's, it's still brilliant because you, you shared a lot. So, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for your time, mate. I really appreciate it. Now, listen, thank you as well. I mean, you know, like I said, I mean, I say, I say to everyone, I came, I came, in, I came in, in the game to be remembered. You know, I want to be remembered as a good fighter. You know, not great, not special, but I want people. To, I want people. I want. I want. I want when I'm dead and gone for people to say to my kids or, or grandkids, "Your dad. Was, your dad was a good fighter." You know, you know what I mean. Your granddad was a good fighter. I, I want. I want to be remembered. So, um, having people like yourself call me and I want to say they want to interview me makes me feel good to say that. You know, Wayne, all that hard work and sacrifice you done as a kid. You know. It's paying off, isn't it? You know, what I mean, you know, my dream was to become a champion and for people to interview me and talk to me. You know, um, you know, from a little young boy, eleven years, twelve years old, when I was when I was starting boxing, 
people around me thought, oh, it's just, it's just a phase or just a, it's just a little phase he's going through. You know what I mean? Or you'll stop by the time he's 13, you know what I mean? You know, even people close to you, not not in a bad way, but, you know, just something that, oh, you'll, you'll grow out of it. And I'm still there. You know what I mean? You know, um, 40 years later or so, 35 years later. So thank you for, um, for reaching out. And, and um, yeah, keep up the good work. Keep it up. And like you say, you're the more up, I mean, like, send me the link or whatever. And like you say, the more, the more practice you get, the more people you'll, you know, you'll get interviewing, you'll get to interview and yeah, you know, um, you never know, this time next year, man, you can be a major player, you know? Yeah. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.